Okay, we're recording. Hello, everyone. Hope all of you guys are doing well. I am doing well. Just so you guys know, today we have a very, very special guest. Today we have Luis Mulgar with us. I've never really said out your 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 whole name at once. Okay, so um, he is my humanities guide, and so to many of you, what would sound appropriate would be he's. He's a teacher. He's he he teaches me. I've never really said that before, but um, no, he's an awesome person, and I would love to more. I'd love to know more about Luis today. First, let's have your introduction. Let's have you introduce yourself, and then let's dive into the questions. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in your platform. Um, my name is Luis, Luis Melgar. Um, I am originally from Guatemala City. I was born and raised there. Um, and then after some time at the university in Guatemala City called Universidad Francisco Marroquín, um, I decided to go to St. John's College. And that's where I am right now. Not the college, but the, the state that's in New Mexico, in Santa Fe. Um, so I studied there, I graduated, um, and ever since I've just been in and out of different learning opportunities, to put it one way, um, teaching and learning. Um, I also am a uh, CrossFit Level 1 instructor, which not a lot of people know about, but I do teach fitness classes, so I got that going as well. And um, right now, I'm currently teaching at TSC, at the Socratic Experience, where Raheen is a student there. Um, and yeah, it's it's been great so far. I've really awesome. enjoyed it. Awesome. So, you know, most of the things I knew about, because I was really, okay, I was really uh, jazzed up to hear your introduction, because I was like, I really want to see how many of these things do I know about, how many of these things I don't know about. I know about you know, you yeah. went to St. John's, you live in Santa Fe. I know that you're an educator and you're from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Now, what I didn't know was that you're a CrossFit instructor. Oh, no, that makes sense. You're doing the yeah, PE so I electives. A little bit in there. I knew you didn't know that. You're doing the PE electives, aren't I'm you? I'm not, actually. That's, that's someone else. Uh, that's, someone like, else. that's someone else. I thought you said um, someone else. I did hear about it. And mm -hmm. yeah, unfortunately, I can't remember his name right now. Um, mm -hmm. But I have heard from Michael that he's sounds like a very experienced person, has many more years of experience under his belt. He is a CrossFit instructor, but he's done many other things as well in other sports, other areas of fitness and health. Um, so I am totally confident that he's the right person for that. Um, I love to help out as much as I can, of course, because I am very familiar with the uh, methodology that he's going to be using. Um, but very excited to hear that, that students at TSC will have the opportunity to, to do that as well. Yeah, because um, like I, I, I thought that you were saying, saying, you know, when you like you introduced this idea in class, I thought it was about someone else. But then when you said you're a level one CrossFit instructor, I'm like, was that person Luis? Because I mean, I was never gonna. I to be honest, I was never gonna do it. Because maybe there's some things you don't know about me, Luis, and that is, I don't like moving. Like, no, <laughs> not my well, I thing. Think motion is motion is very important. You know, the the yeah. class I teach at St. John's, I call it kinesis, um, and and that means motion, pretty much. Uh, and I do think much of what we do at TC, like in our humanities class, or mm -hmm. what we do in STEM class, or you know PPE and the electives, um, it's all really about exercising your mind, right? Uh, I mean, I think learning is very much about that. And this thing, this new um, exercise program, it's about moving your body, right? And and really, it, it, to be healthy and fit, that's that's the big thing you need to be doing, you know, just moving, whether it's running or, you know, yoga or whatever it is, mm -hmm. you do want to be moving your body. So 
That's true. And I feel like, I mean, Luis, we we are familiar with uh I mean, I'm 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 friends with a lot of people in Pod A too, but like in at least in my class, we're familiar with many children and we know like I mean everyone but me games, which I I feel very boomer sometimes when I'm with them, but because I don't game, but a lot of them game and <laughs> I personally know people in my class, they don't, they don't move. And that's, and that's just like me. I'm, I'm not a big moving fan. Right. And so mm-hmm. I feel like this is an awesome initiative because of the whole thing of like, yeah, they're in their chairs all day. This is online school. There's no moving here. And I feel like, you know, um, this could be a start of something. So that is all very very awesome and i'm excited to see i will definitely you know come into one class see how things are going and maybe i like it so i will i will do that you should should definitely try it out see see how it is i might try it out if it's possible (laughs) yeah that 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 would definitely be cool seeing louise teach that because like i wouldn't See, I've only pictured you as a humanities guide. I have not pictured you as, I don't know, like a fitness guide. So I feel, I feel yeah, like that no, would be a, fitness. a different Louise. So now I have a question for you. Um, and this is how I would, I usually mm-hmm. kick off my interviews too. But like this time being a little more specific. How, how were you <laughs> when you were 14? See, I'm 14 years old right now, freshman. Mm-hmm. How would you describe yourself? Like, what are mm-hmm. what are some some things you remember about the fourteen year old Luis? Well, it's it's interesting that you chose fourteen because um, a lot of things um, happened when I was fourteen, um, or at least a lot of things that I remember fondly in terms of of who who I want to be. Um, I guess that the most pinnacle point in, in during that age was uh, that it was the first time I encountered Dante's um, Inferno. And um, I don't know if you've heard of Dante's Inferno, no. but uh, you haven't. Wow. We, we, you see, we have a lot to talk to talk about during humanities then. Um, but that's my favorite, favorite book. It's actually not just the Inferno. I love the whole comedy. It's, it's called the Divine Comedy by Dante Alighieri and, um, but during that time when I was 14, I was told by my English teacher at the time, this was back in Guatemala, um, and I went to a bilingual school. So we always had English class, but a lot of the other classes were also taught in English. And uh, my teacher, she had us all go out and choose a book out of a, you know, a bookstore or a library or whatever. It's a very open assignment. And that was the book we're gonna read uh, individually and then report back with a few writing assignments. Um, So I remember browsing at the uh, bookstore and uh, this book got my attention, which was, you know, there were these flames and there was two guys there and there was like some sort of demon in the background or something like that. And I've always been more so back then an avid uh, gamer, in fact, so I also, did play and credit much of my learning to to video games, but that's a very um, complex conversation, which I'll be happy to have too. But the Dante, I, I picked the book and I started reading it, and this is Longfellow's translation. And I remember that phrase, forest dark, and I'd never encountered anything like that before in English. Um, in my mind, I was like, well, that's that's wrong. It should be dark forest, not forest dark, right? Um, but what it was doing, it was using uh, poetry. Uh, Longfellow was translating Dante and, and doing something of his own in the English language. And for some reason, that phrase alone just really struck me. And then, of course, the subsequent reading of the book um, really struck me. And so that inspired me to become a writer, um, which is still very much what I do and want to keep doing and eventually I want to you know publish books and things like that um but yeah I mean Dante has been a very important figure throughout my life so that 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 will be one major event um 
the other thing, I guess, since I mentioned that the video games, um, I always been a fan of science fiction. And, and when I used to say that people would be like, well, what books have you read if you want to be a science fiction writer? And um, to their surprise, I hadn't read many, much of science fiction at all at the time. And most of my inspiration began with a lot of video games, uh, video games and films. So the likes of The Matrix was very inspirational for me when it came out. Um, in terms of video games, there was a game called Mass Effect that was uh, very inspirational. And I credit that uh, largely how I, I learned English, you know, because despite the fact that I was having classes in English, I was being taught English directly in an English class. Um, much of it I absorbed through playing these games, through the film I watched, um, and some readings I did uh, by myself, largely inspired by these other things. Um, so yeah, that, that was me at 14, you know, I, I had, had many of these interests in writing and learning. And again, the Dante, I think, uh, really, really inspired me to learn more. And it made me able to tackle a lot of other challenges um, as I grew up, because the text is very difficult, you know. Um, that translation is more archaic and, and it's hard to, to get around, but I really just struggled with it, as was the assignment, and um, it, proved, it proved to pay. It paid. Uh, I guess. Awesome. Now, all this writing things, uh, they're reminding me, did you read my writing assignment? But my writing assignment apart. Uh, awesome. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like I, I discovered something I didn't know about, about you and I didn't know about in general. I feel like we should also talk about this in class. You and Leah should do something on that. Um, mm -hmm. And about the gaming side of thing, there's something that I feel like I should discuss with you after this, because uh, it's a new thing that I'm doing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, when when did you come um, to the U.S. or New Mexico, wherever you came, right from Guatemala? When was that time, and where did you come? Mm -hmm. So I believe that was. Uh, I think I came here in 2016. Um, before that, I was in a uh, liberal arts program called the Michael Polanyi College back home in Guatemala um, that was largely inspired by St. John's College. Um, ever since the program, the Michael Polanyi has changed, and I don't really know what they're doing at the moment. Um, but it even changed while I was still there. So I was studying must have been two, three years that, I, that I've been studying there. And they had decided to change things around because the program was very new. Um, so they had this new vision for it. And I, I didn't much like it, you know, I, it wasn't the same thing. Um, so I was faced with a decision and I talked to some of my teachers at the time and uh, many of them who are St. John's graduates and I realized like, you know what, I actually do want to do the whole thing. I want to go through the whole process. And St. John's doesn't do, um, what are they called? Like equivalencies where you um, say have had a year of, of college and then you can start where you left off kind of at St. John's. St. John's has you do the whole program from beginning to end, mm -hmm. right? So, so that's what I had to do. But I was happy actually, because I wanted to do that. You know, I wanted to start again and do the Euclid and the ancient Greek and all these things. Um, so yeah, I decided to leave, come here. And that must have been 2016 around August to start my freshman year. And yeah, it was a very difficult decision, but I, I think it was the right one. I see, because I mean, if if I think of it, it might be a little different because yeah, I I would want I really want to study in the U.S. I mean, that's a whole other thing. 
But would I want to, you know, do that mid college? No, I then if I am somewhere mid college, I wouldn't shift right away. But I feel like that is an important decision that you made. And was it wasn't it like different in Guatemala than it was in Santa Fe? I mean, Santa Fe is it like either it is in New Mexico, either it is not, but it's near. I'm not good with all the geography the only way i even know santa fe is a tv show so no judging here but was it like culturally different yeah. was it a little hard to um get used to or sort of say blend yeah in? i mean it, it's definitely different you know it's the culture is very different um there are similarities for sure and um you know it it helps that um the second most spoken language here in Santa Fe, as I, I, I would think is in New Mexico is Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. Which is my first language. So, um, you know, it makes things easier in a way if, if I want to go back to that. But I actually didn't because it wasn't just coming to Santa Fe, it was going to St. John's. And St. John's is almost its own little subculture. You know, the people there are very unique and they come from all over the place. So that was mostly my uh, initial experience culturally wise, right? Um, not so much like Santa Fe, but the actual college and the kind of uh, environment that it offered with the Johnnies there. Um, but yeah, definitely very different. Um, I, th there are many things I, I wasn't used to. Like I'm sure if I, think back to the kind of person I was, like the little things even, like the kind of grocery shopping I would do or the kinds of places I would frequent back in Guatemala. It's definitely very different now, you know, like I'd never heard of Trader Joe's before and uh, now I, I really actually enjoy going there. <laughs> so. Wait, you hadn't heard, of, heard Trader of Trader Joe's? Joe's? Everybody no, knows about it. Like, home. even I know about it, please. Yeah, you never so. watched Netflix, had you? I had, but I'd never seen it, you know. Maybe I hadn't heard it, but I just, it never yeah. became a thing until I was here and I went to the, to the actual store. I mean, that is me when I heard about Applebee's. It's like, what, what is that? And then... <laughs> See, that I had heard of before. I had heard uh. of now, this is the opposite. Because we do have Applebee's back home. Oh, you guys I do. Think. So we don't we don't have Trader Joe's or Applebee's. We don't we don't have most American brands over here. Like you know, those grocery store types. Um, we have very little brands that are in America, like like chains or franchises. We recently had Baskin Robbins fell in love mm -hmm. um so yeah i know there there are expanding to pakistan and stuff but if i wanted something to come it would definitely be a macy's like i would yeah so <laughs> I see. moving forward how did you get into education now this is one thing that i that i really wanted to ask you and which I believe mm -hmm. I will be asking you this Thursday again, because we have an interview of Luis in class uh, too. Yeah, but how, how did you uh, become a part of the Socratic experience? Which if any of the viewers that do not know the Socratic experience being my viewers, because I mentioned it everywhere, um, is mm -hmm. um, a school that I go to funded by Michael Strong and it's a Socratic school and a very, very unique one. You should check it out. I will leave the link to the website in, this, in the description. And Luis is one of our, um, I mean, I think all of you guys are awesome. But so <laughs> Luis said yes to the interview. He's awesome. Uh, so yeah, one of our awesome guides for humanities, high school humanities. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a great question. How I got into education. Um, well, I mentioned how I got into writing, right? And the inspiration of storytelling really, I think, captures more of that when I was, when I was 14. Um, my interest in education, 
I think it started seriously, like more seriously when I was in college. And the first program I went to um, was uh, political science. And I remember trying to deliberate where to go to after high school, looking at the different um, curriculum offerings. And um, in political science, they claimed that we were gonna be reading Plato and Aristotle and, and talking about some of the more uh, ancient Greek mostly, but you know, ancient Western thought about politics. So it was really interesting. I was like, okay, I, I, I've heard of this and I've read some of my of it my by myself. And I love to do this with a group and you know, dedicated scholars. Unfortunately, um, when I went there, it wasn't so much what was promised. Um, and to be fair, they were just getting started with it. So they promised like Socratic discussions was one of the things they wouldn't they wouldn't have, right? That each class was a Socratic class and that we will read these books. Um, the reality of it was that um, we would all sit in an oval. It wasn't really a circle <laughs> to begin with. It was more of an oval type thing. Some were even like rectangles. And the reason I mention this is because I do believe that the geometry of the classroom is very important. But anyways, there are these rectangles and you would sit around and then the teacher would initiate the conversation um, but it wasn't really a discussion. It was just a lecture that was being done in a rectangle or oval, you know, with the teacher sitting on one end. Um, some of these tried to do certain things like invite others, um, but it just, it wasn't really Socratic discussion, you know. And again, to be fair, they just weren't trained that way. They were probably told that it was going to be a Socratic classroom without really knowing what that meant. And them being like, you know, having all these years of experience of just giving lectures. That's what they did, except that in this different setting. Um, so anyways, I was, I was disappointed. But I myself didn't really know anything about Socratic discussion, right? So part of me is like, Oh, so this is what it was. I guess it wasn't that great. It's very similar to my high school, blah, blah, blah. Um, but there was this one class uh, that I really liked. And the, the person leading it is actually also in the Socratic experience right now, uh, his Albert, Albert Lone. Oh, okay, so, Albert, yeah. I know about him. I, yeah, I actually yeah. wanted to interview him. From <laughs> me wanting to interview him came the idea of me interviewing my guides. So yeah, we mm -hmm. we did the the Declaration of Independence class for PPE mm -hmm. together. Awesome guy. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, so I met Albert, and he was leading this class called the Freshman Experience, and um, that was actually more of what I would think, what I now know to be Socratic discussion, right? So, um, you know, he would give us texts, some more direct directly from the source. That was another thing, by the way, that I was promised Plato and reread secondary texts, which means other people telling you their version of what Plato is saying, right? So you don't ah. get the thing directly, um, which really robs you from, from a great experience, uh, difficult as it may be. And you know this, you read Mino, right? Yeah. You, read, you got the chance to read it directly, so. Mm -hmm. For me at the time, it was like, oh, here's a text that tells you what Mino is about. So it's very uh, restrictive. It doesn't give you the opportunity to encounter the text head on. So anyways, Albert had this class. I really liked it. It was difficult, but he was really um, working with us to talk to each other. Um, and to give an example, the very first class I remember going in, um, and he just sat there and everybody sat down and okay, like three, five minutes went past and nothing was happening. So all the students are staring at each other and starting to look at Albert, like, are you going to do anything? Are we going to start the class? What's going on? Right. And then he starts talking and he just makes the point that why aren't we doing anything? Like, what are we waiting for? Right. Um, 
And that was his way to try to have us internalize the very real fact that we're all there to uh, learn, right? We're all there to take responsibility for our education. So what was he, what he was trying to point to is that you shouldn't be waiting for the teacher to start class. Like class starts at a certain time, we've all agreed to be there, we've all agreed to do this. Then it's really all of our responsibilities to, to do that, right? So either we can start the conversation, but so could I, or so could, you know, John or Melanie or whoever's in the class, right? Just as I hope you feel like you can start and initiate conversations during class, right? So, but all of that was very new and especially in Guatemala, even the culture is different and so accustomed to authority that it's very difficult to break free of that, right? So that take, took many, many sessions. And sorry, I'm trying not to make this story too long, um, but Albert was the first, uh, teacher I had that really introduced me to the, the Socratic method. And Albert was going to move to a separate department and open up the Micropolitan College along with others. So that's why I transferred there. And in the Micropolitan, um, under uh, Albert's leadership um, is where I really started to learn more about the Socratic method and about education and pedagogy and I really started getting interested in it because all my life I had thought, um, I knew there was something wrong with the way education was working, the way mm. I was being taught in school, but I, I was never able to articulate it. Like I, I couldn't really say why or, or more importantly, what the alternative was. So with Albert's class and then the program, I could really see it, you know, and it's so much different when you can actually experience it. You can like, oh God, this is so much better, you know? Yeah. And so that was really what inspired me to just keep working on that. And we had a lot of freedom in the program, um, largely because it was so new, we had to sort of innovate, you know, we we're pioneering um, many of the things we were trying to accomplish. And so, yeah, again, those were two years and I was so into it that I wanted to keep going and, and go to St. John's. Awesome. Um, I mean, I, I, I totally understand how one of Albert's class could do that. Cause honestly, I don't, I don't come from the U S and that is why U S history may not be, well, was not the biggest of my interest and and so I, I knew almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so we got to read the Declaration of Independence and we need to do that in class. And what I didn't know was that Michael wouldn't be in class. So I was, I was ready for, I mean, Michael's awesome in PPE, but it's just like, I didn't like the US history. The problem uh -huh. was my end. <laughs> and I was in, uh, so I, I go there and I'm like, I don't see Albert there. Uh, I saw, I, I don't see Michael there and I'm like, where's Michael? Like I go in and I, you know, say rare, like right there. And like, I was like, Michael won't be here today. It's me here. And, you know, it's, it's a nice new person. And he, he introduces him. He introduces himself. And then I ask him for an interview. And then I, you know, like we had a whole chat about how he should have a LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, I don't know why. And I should make him one. But um, mm -hmm. the way that we sort of talked about the declaration really sparked an interest, which mm -hmm. made me more eager in, you know, more sessions with Michael that were about the Constitution and then about the Federalist papers. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like he, he, his class kind of made me discover a newfound interest of mine, which remembers, which reminds me, I need to send you a paper which you need to kind mm -hmm. of go over and give me more feedback on, but. Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, so no, Albert has done that for me. And so, you know, when you were saying about, edu you know, how that was more of a rectangle and everything, um, and, the, and the teacher was just giving a, a lecture, but just the 
how the class would have been, you know, sitting. Just so to say the choreography was different. The song was the same. Mm-hmm. Now, I my first question, and I was just going to ask that when you said that, is like, were the teachers trained to facilitate a Socratic, you know, a discussion? Because I think it really matters because you and Leah, Leah is mm-hmm. the other guide. There's two guides in each class. Because you and uh, you and Leah are are not told where you guys are trained and you guys have that experience in the field that you guys are able to handle situations and able to facilitate a, a healthy um, a healthy conversation between young people that that is because you've been trained. If you were just be like, it's the same thing, but it's a Socratic circle. Then you would make a rectangle, be like, let's call that a circle. And I'm going to start giving a lecture. So I feel like it's more of they were they were starting out. They didn't know what to do, but I'm pretty sure they've evolved to be some someplace at, the, at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the training is really important. And um, well, the first thing that came to mind as you were just talking is that uh, uh, there's a reason why why we're called guides at TSE and not teachers, Mm -hmm. right? And that's a more appropriate question to ask Michael about because he has even more ideas about it. But the way I understand it is that teacher unfortunately has certain connotations nowadays that are, they come out of uh, a lot of traditional education, right? Mm -hmm. but as a guide, I feel that my role sort of shifts depending on the needs of the, the class and the students individually. Um, sometimes it may necessitate a type of lecturing, right? Mm-hmm. It's not that lecturing is bad or the lectures are bad. It's that the lectures are not Socratic discussion and they each have their own place, right? I think there's actually a way in which you can take the most out of a lecture um, and being truly engaged uh, like there's a, a method to that too, but when it comes to Socratic discussion, um, yeah, it's there's facilitation, there's asking questions, there's uh, leading, referencing, bringing experiences, a bunch of things. And I've been lucky enough that I've had the experience since um, this class with Albert to just all of my education ever since has been largely, largely Socratic, mostly Socratic, you know. Um, and, and the other thing I wanted to mention is just that while we have had um, training, it's still something we're learning to do. You know, you never perfect it. It's still an ongoing process of figuring out the best ways, the best practices to, uh, um, you know, make the class, the culture, the most fruitful it can be. That's, uh, that's true. And so I wanted to talk about something important. And now that I'm talking about it, I'm kind of feeling, you know, the interview that I'm going to do with you and Leah in class. I, I, mm-hmm. It's just like I'm talking about everything that I'm going to talk about right now. But uh-huh. that's not gonna, you know, you know, mess around with the other one's value. Because again, mm-hmm. that's going to be a whole different thing because it's in class. Um, yeah. And it has a whole different, I'd say, vibe to it and an environment that it's in. But, um, you know, I feel that with, with even, even like you're, you're, you facilitate Socratic discussions in our class and you are guides for um, high school humanities. And now just so you guys know, we're all together. So we have freshmen, um, sophomores, juniors, and seniors all together, like I'm a freshman and my best friend in class is a senior. So mm-hmm. um, I would say that in order to truly be able to facilitate a Socratic discussion and to be able to uh, sort of cultivate that learning environment, you need you need some freedom. If Michael or uh, Kevin or anybody for that matter keeps on dictating what you're gonna do. And there's whole, I mean, I have nothing against planners 
maybe a little mm -hmm. bit, but like I have nothing against planners or anything or schedules, but if they keep on dictating, now this is what you're going to do, this is what you're going to do, no, that's wrong, send that back. Or if for our quarterly reports, which are going to come out soon, mm -hmm. uh, if, you know, they're like, no, the comments are too nice or the comments are too bad, because I've seen this happening recently with a, with a family friend that she did not have that sort of liberty that she should have had. Um, mm -hmm. how, how would you say that that is important or an important part of your role um, as part of the Socratic experience? And why do you think that that's even important in the first place? Uh, if I understood you correctly, you're talking about students sort of taking ownership of their own uh, education, is that right? Yeah, like that too, and how you need to have enough, you know, freedom. freedom. Not everything can be dictated by the school, like your, your freedom mm -hmm. to kind of go crazy as a facilitator, come up with ideas on your own, do that, and also you giving them the freedom of expression of ideas that are appropriate so yeah yeah i see I, I hear like freedom in many levels of the organization sounds like not just for students but for guides in the yeah. way they conduct class and all of that yeah i think it's really important it's really important i mean that's really why i i uh, decided to join join tsc um i've had like other opportunities to teach in other places but um, I just, I never wanted to do that because I knew in my heart that that wasn't the way I would like to do it. Um, and it largely has to do with, with what you're just saying, like having the, the freedom to do what I think is best for class. Um, in other organizations, I might have to, you know, follow the plans that uh, the director laid out or, mm -hmm. um, which is not bad in and of itself you know, some planning is necessary in any organization. Um, but the, the way that it was done, the, the rules that were needed to be followed are too restrictive, too binding. Um, I did have some experiences like that back home. I did teach for a while and um, I was teaching a class that was, I think, a kind of elective, you know, students would choose from a list and um, it took about, a few, it took like maybe, I don't know, five sessions to figure out that none of them really wanted to be there. <laughs> like they had chosen that class because it was the easiest in their minds. It was a literature class. Um, and they were just there to get a certain grades that would average with the rest of their classes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was very difficult because the way everything was structured um, made it so that these students found themselves in that position and us as teachers there in the position of uh, having students that didn't want to be there, right? Um, luckily, I think there's workarounds, but uh, there shouldn't be, you know, there shouldn't have to be a workaround. Um, as guides, as students, we should all feel comfortable in class. We should all be clear about what we're doing and why we're doing it, um, because that's the only way that we're going to truly truly learn you know um so absolutely i mean the freedom in the class for the guides is is absolutely important yeah and i mean what were these learners thinking what literature if i understand it correctly you know mm -hmm. again if I said literature in the Socratic experience, and if that is an elective, and if I want some easy grades, I would never go there first. Because that's not an easy grade. When I'm saying literature, then I expect to be presented with like the the stuff like, you know, Antigone by Sophocle. I, I Like that was a play, but I would, <laughs> come that as literature. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Well, you have and, to keep in mind that, that literature for them, um, in their minds, was largely a reflection of some literature classes they probably had in the past, uh -huh, where yeah. they likely just were handed down, like, write a 
simple essay on whatever you like. And, you know, I don't know, it, it might have been experiences that are much not what you see at, at TSC. I'm sure they weren't reading Antigone or Mino or anything like that. Yeah, I that was not so I knew that when I was going to come into TSC, I knew that we were going to need like some grown up stuff. That, that's how I defined it. Look mm -hmm. at me now. I, I have grown. But um, I didn't know like this was the level because see my previous uh, reading experience has have been um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, uh, Matilda, uh, David Copperfield, uh, mm -hmm. The Prince and the Pauper and Just Those Stories. So these five awesome things that I've and The Phantom Tollbook, which I mean, no offense if my previous teachers watching but I hated the book it wasn't you it's the book um yeah so th these were my you know reading experiences and so my reading level wasn't up wasn't like that so when I first my first in class was when we were reading the Immanuel Kant um enlightenment so I was like <laughs> oh and so just reading that I was like okay now this is a whole huge new level yeah and then yeah. so on so forth we started reading we read a couple things in the middle probably that i do not remember but the main things that we read was mino and antigone so mm -hmm. i would i would say that it depends on your sir correcting what i was going to say i it depends on what your previous experience of literature has been that would you think literature is easy grades or not thinking of my experience and the Socratic experience of easy grades I would not go to literature for easy grades I would go to literature mm -hmm. if I am sure that I would want to read more and if there was something like that I would actually join that yeah yeah and a lot of this has to do with the the person's dispositions you know um like if if the student is is willing to do this is, is wanting to um even if it's really really difficult um and maybe they they don't see a real passion for it yet um, but they're willing to work with you that alone goes very 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 far um i mean at tsc it's it's amazing because i mean you're you're 14 right and yeah. uh, here we are, you're interviewing me, like I would never see anything like that back home in the kind of uh, structure we they have there, right? Um, for, for multiple reasons. But one of which is that they don't uh, really trust uh, students. They don't see what they're really capable of. Um, and I'm sure like people listening right now wouldn't, unless if you hadn't said that you're 14 they might have not known that you're 14 because you still oh, yeah. exhibit a lot of maturity for your age and I'm sure yeah I'm i got told to that a lot that. yeah like the way you conduct yourself the way you carry yourself and all the experience you already have um are a testament to that right and mm -hmm. and it's exactly the kind of thing i hope tsc is uh showing for people i mean two weeks ago i was reading keats with middle schoolers right <laughs> which Akits is, is very, very difficult to read. And yet I believe that they were having uh, great insights into the story, you know. I mean, I so. hear the middle schoolers. Now the thing is, you know, when you're in high school, though I'm a freshman, I just feel so grown up around middle schoolers that I have the, yeah. the high school school thing on. Cause like this girl from middle school, she texted me for some work and I had to keep like the whole school thing on. Cause like if I'm a freshman, I, you know, I'm I'm a high schooler. I'm just like in the mm -hmm. in 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 a zone. But I I hear to a lot of the them like I hear Elon and um I hear Brennan from time to time. And when I hear all the awesome things that they have to say in PPE, because we do that together, I go like, mm -hmm. uh, this is me as a freshman thinking about the constitution that I have barely yeah. read and yeah. they're there 
the middle schoolers and they have read it in depth and all of that. So I'm like constantly in awe of just how yeah. it is. And so, I mean, I see because of us all studying together, I think in our discussions, it's awesome because mm -hmm. there's a whole different view, like Enzo and T, they're, they're seniors, but yet me, Preston, and a couple others were freshmen. So I feel like it really has a whole blend of different backgrounds and different perspectives. And I feel like that's kind of necessary for a Socratic dialogue. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I think the, the best uh, dialogues um, come from a, a group that's very diverse, you know, um, and that can be culturally, age wise. Um, it makes for the most interesting conversations because everybody brings different things to the table, right? And if you have the right uh, tools set for a good conversation to happen, and that's where you really get the the exponential growth. Yeah, and so because I've had so many conversations with so many people with like different backgrounds, I've and even group discussions, I've I I think I've just realized that it is that you would view a certain thing a topic or uh, something like peace or racism, you would perceive it differently. You would think about it differently a lot of times because of the cultural differences. Now, a lot of times in class, I would think about something differently because I didn't grow up in the US. I didn't, I am, I, I'm mm -hmm. born, raised Pakistan. And maybe you have that thing somewhere too, because you weren't raised in the US, you were raised in Guatemala. And so you were mm -hmm. able to yeah. see that, okay, there's a difference between the two. And so I feel like it's important that way too. And I feel like it just makes a learning environment way more, way more, um, interesting if there's diversity and even if there isn't you need to i think just i i, I don't know what i'm trying to say anymore because i kind of lost that thread now this is time for you to like fill in for me for like the greatest message of all times <laughs> well uh, i don't know if this is where you were going but uh there is a sense in which we we always have diversity um you know not necessarily culturally or age-wise as i was referencing before but we are still all unique individuals and even if we're all in a room with say all american people talking um given our different backgrounds and experiences maybe some have traveled here and there or you know um it's always going to make a, a good mix of things enough so that you have a great conversation yeah um, that's true and I mean, in them alone, they come from different backgrounds because, okay, I'm, I'm still pretty mesmerized because I just came to know that the Marinos, they, they live in Las Vegas. So I, I'm still pretty jazzed up about the fact that I have classmates that oh. live in Las Vegas. Like, how cool is that? In Las Vegas, yeah. Is this Sebastian? Yeah, it's Sebastian, Enzo, and Lola. Yeah. All three of them, because like they're siblings, oh, okay. so interesting yeah i did not know that yeah yeah no yeah. i i did because of projects and stuff i'm actually pretty good friends with them now so yeah uh mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming on Luis. honestly it was awesome talking to you and for yeah. everybody that's listening um yeah we talked about some awesome points we talked about some points that you guys probably never understood like oh so that was that pe elective we were talking about so uh yeah uh it, it is very it is very nice because this is the first person that i've interviewed um that is one of my guides too um thank you so much for being on luis it is a pleasure having you on and to how of uh, like to the kind of discussion that we've had feels like we would we would definitely come on here 
again with another session, probably with a more focused topic. So we have some time to think about it or, you know, explore about it ourselves. So thank yeah. you so much for being here. I uh, do stay back after I turn off the recording. Yeah, no. though. Sure. Thank you for having me. It was, it was my pleasure as well. Had a lot of fun. Thank you.